Well, this summer we're going to theme parks, visiting theme parks. Last week I asked you when you go, and you will go, uh, get a picture out in front of you and your family and send it to me. Monday I got one by email from one of our families down at King's Dominion. Well, wherever you go, somebody told me in the first service they're going to Disneyland. Then another family said they're going to Disneyland. Everybody goes to Disney World, but some are going to Disneyland. Let me warn you, Disney's going to get your money. <laughs> I read in the New York Times this morning the, uh, the price for a one-day ticket to the Magic Kingdom for one person is about $175. And don't think you're going to cheat them. Don't think you're going to get around it. They'll get every dollar you take down there. But do go. Go anyway. Have a big time. Leave your offering here before you go. (laughs) But then go. Last theme park I went to was in California too. It was Universal Hollywood, Universal Studios. Two years ago, Audra and I were out in Southern California with some friends who knew a lot of people. So we spent time with Hollywood producers, the producer of Dumb and Dumber, one of my favorite films, Uh, uh, the president of Hallmark Movie Channel, and a lovely young actress, 15-year-old Bailey Madison. And we went in on VIP passes, which was a waste for me because I don't ride anything. I just usually sit down and drink coffee. So it was a waste but anyway, we were there, and so we were moving through the park, and Bailey is just a, just a beautiful young woman. She starred in ABC's uh, Snow White presentation. She was on Hallmark's um, The Good Witch. So a lot of kids especially know her and love her, and as we're walking through the park, I noticed she was continually stopped by just hordes of teenagers wanting to take selfies. Nobody wants autographs anymore. They want selfies. And she paused, and with everyone, she smiled, she asked about them, she was so courteous. I acted like I didn't know who she was, and when somebody was walking away, I said, who is that? Why is everybody talking to her? And they looked at me like I was a dinosaur and said, you don't know, that's Bailey Madison. When it was all over and everybody had uh, moved away, I went over to her and I said, Bailey, I was watching, and I saw what you did, and I noticed you took time with every one of those people. Thank you for doing that. They're the people who made you a star. Don't ever forget those folks. I said, Bailey, don't forget where you came from. Now, that's what I want to say to us today. Don't you forget where you came from. We're talking about great themes in the Bible, and this is one of the greatest, the theme of creation. Do you know where you came from? The text could be Genesis 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know that passage, but I want us to look at Psalm number 8. So would you get your Bibles out and uh, look at Psalm number 8? We got half the room can see the screen, but we don't have words on the screen anyway, so it doesn't matter. You need your Bible. Turn to Psalm number 8. And look at verse 1. Psalm number 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants... You have ordained praise. Just as I read that in the first service from the, from the lips of infants, two or three babies started crying <laughs> all over the room. And that was a good reminder. That doesn't bother me. They're in some way praising God. And they're probably hungry and need to be changed too. But. <laughs> from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and you crowned him with glory and honor. This is quoted in the New Testament, and in the New Testament, It's a reference to Jesus, but in the Old Testament, it's a reference to you. 
and to me, little lower than the heavenly beings, crowned with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The late Harvard paleontologist Stephen J. Gould many years ago was quoted in, the, in Time magazine. He said this, Humankind is a cosmic accident. We have no more but no less reason for existence than does the cockroach. That's a pretty pessimistic view, isn't it? A cockroach. I hope that's not the prevailing view, but I know many scientists do believe that there's really no mystery or magic to human beings. We're just further up on the evolutionary chain. I think there's got to be more to it than that. Many believe in the, uh, in the Big Bang 13 to 15 billion years ago from one speck of matter and some energy. There was an explosion and everything that is came to be. The atheist has his own equation of existence. It goes like this. Nothing times nobody equals everything. Nothing. That's what we start with. Times nobody. There's nobody out there guiding this. Equals everything. That takes a lot of faith to believe, it seems to me. I like what we believe better. And we believe it by faith. But it makes sense, doesn't it? That God created everything there is in the universe. He created the universe and all that is within it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Somebody has said that if you can believe that one sentence, the first sentence in your Bible, then you shouldn't have trouble believing anything else that's in the Bible. Because at the very beginning of time, there was God already there, and he created. He created everything that is out of nothing, absolutely nothing. And so it all came to be. No, we're not uh, equal to cockroaches, and we're not accidents. We're not afterthoughts of the divine. No, God deliberately created us. He made you. He set out to create you, and he did it in love. Three things I want to say about this. We'll put them out there, and you can think about them this week. Number one, we need to contemplate God's plan. Contemplate his plan. Think about it. What was God doing? Psalm 139, verse 14 says, We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And what the writer in Psalm 8 is saying is we are the crown of God's creation. On the sixth day, he created man, and then he rested, not because he was tired, but because he had finished his work. And he was setting a pattern for us that one day out of the seven, we need to stop and rest. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at Genesis 1, and look at verse 26. Very important statement about where you came from. Chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You're made in the image of God. That's not something that's going to show up on an autopsy or in an EKG. It's certainly not a reference to skin color or anything like that. But what does it mean to say that we are created in the image of God. Well, I don't know all the answer, but I got part of it, and I want to give it to you. First of all, God is a trinity, and so are we. 
Trinity. We sang it this morning. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three, and yet one. And so are you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, Paul is praying that God would sanctify us through and through, body, soul, and spirit. That's your trinity. Body, you know what that is. Everybody sees it. Body, soul, that's you beneath the skin. That's the real you. That's your mind, your will, and your emotions. Spirit. Sometimes soul and spirit are used interchangeably, and we talk like that, but I think it's different. You're a body, you're also a soul, but deep in the center of who you are is spirit. That's the place God designed just for himself. That's where he wants to come and live. And when you give your life to Christ, the spirit of God comes to live in your spirit, and you are whole. God's a trinity. And so are we. Something else? God is a personality. And so are we. He's a personality. He has a mind. He has a will. He acts. He has emotions. God feels things. Do you know it's possible for you to grieve God? Yeah, the Bible says that. As great and powerful as He is, you can cause grief. When you reject him, when you, when you disobey him, that grieves his spirit. He's a personality, so are we. We have the ability to contemplate our existence. No other mammals do that. To actually think about ourselves, that's personality. Something else. God is a moral being, and so are we. Moral Having the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. All of us have that. As I said last week, sometimes our consciences have been seared because of sin. We've just done something so, mo- so long and so often we, we don't feel it anymore. But still, deep inside, there's a sense of right and wrong. There's a, there's a craving for justice. When somebody, even a child says, but that's not fair. Where'd they get that? God is a moral being, and so are we. God is spiritual, and so are we. We're the only creatures made by God that can contemplate God. That praying mantis is not really praying. But you are, I I hope, when you bow your head and you lift up a prayer. You have the ability to talk about God and the ability to talk to him. You're spiritual. God is creator. That's the very first thing we learn about him. Page one of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. Well, you can create too. Not in exactly the same way. What God made, he made out of nothing. He created, there was nothing and then God, then God made it happen. We don't have that ability. But we take the, the raw materials that God has provided us. And we can make things too. We can take clay or wood. We can take words or musical notes. We can take the things God gives us and we can create. And I want you to hear this. I don't think you're ever more godly than when you are creating something. God put that in you. And you've got something you can do. Regardless of your age, find it and begin to use it. To write, to sing, to dance, to mold, to sculpt. Do something creative. Because you give glory to God when you do. He is a creator and so are we. And one more thing. The Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 2, that the Spirit of God brooded upon the waters. And we do that too. There was chaos at the beginning and God wanted to bring order out of it. And we have that desire for there to be order and peace in the world. That comes from God. So contemplate the plan that he had. 
We're the crown of his creation, created in his image. And even though sin enters in Genesis chapter 3, and uh, the snake makes his appearance, and sin enters the human race, even though that happened, and and the, the image of God in our lives has been broken, okay, it's not what it used to be. It's been broken, but it's still there. There's still sparks of it and evidences of it. And God wants to remake it. God wants to do something brand new with it. Contemplate his plan. But something else. Consider the process. Consider the process. How did he do it? Well, he did it in two ways. He created us in words and by his hands. He used words and his hands. The Bible says that he spoke and the world came to be. Let there be light and let there be this and let there be that. It's interesting. If you read Genesis 1, check this. He, he talks about the, the light of the day and the light of the night, but he doesn't, he doesn't call them by their names, the writer. doesn't say the sun and the moon. That's obviously what he's talking about, but he doesn't give them that much credence because in the ancient world people were worshiping the sun and others were worshiping the moon and the writer of Genesis 1 wants us to know only God is worthy of our worship so there are lights there are lights out there but he spoke and they came to be when I uh, marry young folk and or any age folk I always say this I believe it with all of my heart and I want to remind people of it that God creates with words and he's still doing it still doing it because a couple will stand there you've seen it you've done it they say some words I say some words and God puts his hand upon the the matter and something that has never existed before suddenly comes into being right before our eyes poof there it is with words That's how God creates. By the words of the Lord, the Bible says, the the heavens are made. By the breath of his mouth, the stars in the sky, Psalm 33, verse 6. He does it with words. You know, words can be powerful. This is not one of the themes I'm going to be talking about this summer, but it probably ought to be. Words have the power to create relationships. Words have the power to build up. Try it sometime. Try it today when you're encountering somebody serving you in a restaurant or somebody behind the, the uh, desk in a store and the person in front of you is just, is just all over them about some infraction and then you step up and with a big smile on your face, encourage them. Notice the change. How their countenance lifts. It will make their day. It might make their week. It could make their life. And you've given them life by your words. You know where I learned that? I learned it from our former pastor, Jay Wolf. You remember Jay? You have been here a long time. I've known him for years. I knew him before I came here. And I would watch him. I would watch him interact with people. And every person I ever saw him talk to, he'd look them in the eye, he'd smile, and he'd say something positive about them. And I would see the change come across their face. I thought, I could learn to do that. I need to do that. We can all learn to do it. If we'll use words that are positive and build up. That's what God did. He created by saying it. But he also used his hands. And so the Bible speaks of him taking the clay of the earth and fashioning man. And then he said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper exactly right for him. And God then performed some surgery on Adam and took from his side. And when Adam finally woke up from the anesthesia, he looked over and he saw the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. Well, that goes without saying. He, he (laughs) He saw this beautiful creature and he said, wow, this is it. This is exactly what I've been waiting for. God did it with his hands. So with words and with hands, God creates. 
And he created you a little lower than the heavenly beings, but he crowned you with glory and with strength. One more thing before we go. We need to be clear about what God's purpose was in all of this. God's purpose. It's not right to say that God needed us. I don't think we need to say God needed anything. He is perfect within himself. But the scripture does say that we exist for his sheer pleasure. He made us because he wanted to make us. He made us because of the great love that he had to share. He created you that he might love you. He created you and me so that we might serve him and accomplish his purpose in the world. Did you read about Joey Chestnut this week? While you were uh, watching the fireworks on the 4th of July, he was at Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. You know, they have this every year. And uh, he won. His uh, nickname is Jaws. And I guess it makes sense. In 10 minutes, he, he broke his own record. In 10 minutes, he ate 72 hot dogs. His mama's proud of him, and we're all proud of him. No, no record of how the rest of his day went. I don't think it could have gone very well. But some people are so anxious for their 15 minutes of fame and celebrity that they will hurt their bodies and they'll do ridiculous things. Better, I think, to use that body and use that time to do something like our teenagers are doing right now north of us and uh, east of us out in Bulgaria. Let's do what they're doing, sharing the message of Jesus right here in our own town, making a difference. Yeah, he created us so that we might serve him. We're not automatons. We're not slaves. He's created us as sons and daughters. And Jesus called us friends that we might serve him. Now he's taken all creation and the scripture says in so many places, he's put it under our authority. Now that means you and I are supposed to be caretakers of this universe this earth, this planet where we live. We are responsible. Now, I believe Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, the Bible says the elements will melt with a fervent heat and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. I know that and I believe that, but we don't know when he's coming. And while we wait, we take care of this planet. We're responsible for it. We need to be good stewards of it. We didn't sing it today, but I love that hymn. This is my father's world. And to my listening ear, all nature sings. And round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hand, the wonders wrought. This is our father's world. And the Bible says that Adam would walk with God in the cool of the day. This is before sin entered into the human race. They would walk and have great fellowship together in the beauty of nature. One of my favorite poems, I've shared it with you before, is by Wendell Berry. He writes about this. I thought about it last night when we had such a beautiful evening outside. When despair grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great grand heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief, I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting for their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and I am free. That's what God wants for us to experience in this life. Now, God's creator, and he's created all that there is. We give him praise for that. E.V. Hill, the the late uh, great African-American preacher, 
ask the question once, well, what's the greatest thing God ever did? What was his best day that God ever had, his best act? And you could argue, well, this day, creation, when he spoke and it happened, you could, you could name and you could make a case for any number of things. E.V. Hill said, no, the greatest creation God ever had was when he recreated you. If you're a Christian, you've been created twice. He made you physically, body, soul, and spirit. But then when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he recreated you. He made you something new, brand new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If this were my last sermon as your pastor, that'd be what I'd want to leave with you. That his act of recreation is the greatest work of all. Let it happen. Let it happen to you by putting your faith and trust in Christ today. Okay? Let's bow our heads together. Father, we ask now that you speak to our hearts and that you draw us to yourself May your will be done in these moments, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be right here at the front on the floor, and if you, if you today are ready to profess your faith, you have put your faith in Christ, but nobody knows it, you step out and come, and we'll baptize you some Sunday in the future. If you are a Christian and want to be a part of this fellowship, and you've been baptized by immersion, you come on. We would love to have you be a part of First Baptist. Let's stand and we sing.